Hi, my name is Bill Kennedy, and welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. This is where we get to uh, interview and talk to people in the tech industry, but we try to have a more intimate conversation instead of just diving deep into technical you know, know-how and things like that. And today, my guest, I'm so excited. Today, my guest is John Arundel from, where are you from, John? You're, you're there in the UK, right? Yeah, I'm from Cornwall, England. Cornwall, awesome. So we got John today from Cornwall, and I'm really excited to talk to you, John, because uh, you know we've never met. I don't think we've ever met. Now we know each other from Twitter, and you're now writing a series of Go books, which uh, I got to review that last blog post you did. I, your writing is excellent, so it's always it's it's always nice to meet somebody who who can write as well as you do so that's exciting coming from you that means a lot no I, no i it's I, you know i read a lot of stuff and it's 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 a skill but it's i don't know i don't know how to say it but i i, I love your writing and um the new go book that that i that you had just come out for learning go was excellent too so i'm really really excited to talk and you you've been in the industry for for a while now, right? How long have you been in this industry at this point? Like 30 years, maybe? Yeah, a good long time. Probably more years than I care to specify exactly. <laughs> That's right, I was trying to hold back on that. <laughs> Suffice it to say that uh, I've picked up a few gray hairs. Yeah, and so I, I think one of the things I want to try to get to in, in the hours, how you stumbled upon Go, right? Um, but but I'd, I'd love to kind of start maybe f more from the beginning. I love hearing stories about how people kind of got started with computers and programming. So what is your maybe first memories of, you know, hitting a keyboard and, 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 and getting involved in learning or writing code or computers in general? Yeah, we tend to start early, don't we, in this game? <laughs> It's like, you know, you don't find people who are kind of, uh, you know, a carpenter all their life and then they suddenly discover computers <laughs> in midlife. It just doesn't seem to happen that way. Uh, it didn't with me very, very early on. I think um, when I was uh, about uh, nine years old, uh, my mum quit smoking, um, which was a great idea. And... With the money that she saved from not smoking, she decided she's going to buy something, you know, what to buy. Maybe one of these newfangled computers we're hearing about, you know, they're in all the news in the early 80s. So uh, so she buys a computer and, you know, it comes, she uh, unboxes it and, you know, goes through all the setup. And she's kind of like, right, I'm going to get to grips with this now. And uh, she does, which is really cool. So my mom rocks. <laughs> um, she was my first uh, computer science instructor. And uh, so she had me up and running writing basic programs pretty quickly. And uh, I remember that, uh, you know, she called me in to be the guinea pig for her new program. And the, and the program says, you know, what is your name? I, I type in my name is John and it says, hello, John. <laughs> I'm completely blown away with this because the machine knows my name. How, how does it know my name? I mean, I'm having a conversation with the machine. This is fantastic. That's amazing. And, and your, what was your mom's background? She's not got a technical background at all. She's got a PhD in criminology and uh, degrees in languages and so forth like this. So, uh, you know, I think she is more more focused towards me really i think she was thinking maybe this is something i should introduce john to at an early age right you know this could be a it, good career for him kind of thing so did you have to compete for time on this computer now you know because your mom's like really into it and now you're you're getting kind of sucked into it or was it yeah she was definitely into it but i think she recognized that uh, me and the machine had an even more special relationship you know, like clearly we were made for each other, me and this little box, the Sinclair ZX81, which was a fantastic machine, I have to say. Wow. Okay. So, 
Um, just for some time reference, at, at this point, are you in high school? Or are you in, uh, I guess in the U.S., we call it middle school or junior high school? Like Yeah, yeah middle school. Uh, and pretty soon okay, they yeah. get the same computer at school. And uh, it's kind of something, you know, of course, nowadays, no one's, no one would think that would be remarkable for a computer to be in school. But this was a time when, you know, it was a very special and magical box, which everybody had, a, had to kind of be introduced to, you know, people would very gingerly approach the sacred machine and press the key, you know, and it would kind of go bleep error. You go, Oh no, maybe I broke <laughs> the computer. This is so expensive, you know. But did you have, did you end up in high school having formal classes or was it also trying to compete for some time on the machine? Yeah, I think I did. I think basically, you know, there was, there was some computing that we were sort of expected to do as part of school. And they did that, but also every other moment which was legally or even not legally allowable, I would sneak in there and be playing with this thing. And, and what are some of the things that you'd be, would, were you writing? Because I, I remember at that same time, at around that same age, I was writing in basic as many kind of video games, not like what you see today, obviously, but I was writing a lot of kind of games. What, what kind of programs were you writing? Yeah, absolutely. I was writing the world's worst games. So, you know, the adventure game with three rooms, uh, you know, and uh, no puzzles. Um, <laughs> but I was, uh, you know, very slowly loading from tape and so forth. But uh, I think um, I was uh, completely in love with this idea that, you know, basically the machine can do anything. If you can figure out what instructions to give the machine? It can do basically anything you want it to. And there's nothing else in the world like that, is there? And before the computer, there really wasn't any such thing. The only thing I can think of which gets close is, you know, reading books and being transported into this imaginary world of a book where you can go anywhere. Computers like that, but it's, it's more interactive, right? You can create the world. Yeah, I, I think for me it was two things. It was having complete domain over the machine, right? And the more you learn, the more you could do. But it was also the idea that if you made a mistake, you could hit the delete key. <laughs> Where like when I'm working in my house and I try to put something on the wall and I go to the wrong spot on the wall, now it's a major nightmare to clean that up. <laughs> but on the computer, I'm always, I'm always like, oh, I wish I could just hit the delete key and start over, and I can't. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, anything you can imagine, you can create, if only you know how to issue the right instructions. So it is magic, in effect, isn't it? I mean, we're describing magic. Yeah, if you know, yeah. if you okay. know the spell, you can have whatever you want. That I love. If you know the spell, then you, you can create that result that you want, right? Yeah, actually, that's really cool. And I see that same excitement in the people that I teach programming to today. You know, at some point they, they just suddenly get this idea and they take off with it. It's wonderful to see that because I remember what it felt like. I still feel that when I solve a problem that I thought was going to be challenging or something I really wanted to make happen and then it happens. I, I still feel that. Don't you still feel that a little bit today? All right, so you're in high school and you're... Um, you're spending as much time as you can. Did you play sports at all either? or like, You must have had other activities and hobbies too, or was it really your focus was there when, when you had free time? Yeah, I, don't think, I wasn't really a big sports guy, um, but I wasn't exactly a classic nerd either. So <laughs> something in the middle. Like, you know, I, I think um, I definitely enjoyed playing with the computer but of course i didn't have my own at this point um apart from you know the very simple uh, basic machine and so but in school i'm i'm being introduced to things like uh, logo which is incredible i don't know if, if kids still use logo but uh, you know essentially we're learning programming through graphics effectively you know if you remember the original um, logo systems in the 60s the computer was actually connected to a little robot uh, the turtle which can move around and you can give it instructions like go forward 10 turn right 
you know, and it had a pen attached to it. So you could actually draw on a piece of paper. So people would write instructions in logo to draw a particular figure. And of course you have the idea of functions, right? You know, you can compose uh, these behaviors and you can repeat them and you can do loops. So like draw a circle 10 times, but slightly offset each time. So, you know, you can create beautiful designs. Yeah, I, d I never got to experience any of that. So that's, that's super interesting. Yeah, we didn't have a real robot, but it would draw on screen, you know. So as you're, as you're getting through high school um, and then you're thinking about the next steps of what you're going to do, is, is the idea of being a, a software developer or, or a field in the computer industry kind of on your radar screen at that point? Yeah, I don't think I really had a clear idea exactly what I would be doing, but I was pretty convinced that uh, my future lies with these machines somehow. You know, I don't exactly know what it's going to be, but uh, because this is the most fun thing I can imagine doing, and I seem to be reasonably good at it, it seems like a good fit. So what happens now after after uh, high school? You go to university? What, what, what do you do next? Yeah, that's right. So, um, so I go to college to study computing because it seems like the obvious thing. Um, I, I want to you know, learn uh, some CS concepts and I want to get to use, you know, the kind of computers that the university has. And I remember um, for the, uh, we, we have a kind of an open day where students can come to the university, have a tour around and see what the facilities are and so forth. And, and I come to uh, University of East Anglia um, in Norwich, England, and uh, they have a fantastic uh, computer system set up. They have um, a transputer machine. So this is, this is another blast from the past. <laughs> you remember transputers? So this, this was uh, early 90s. Uh, so we're talking, you know, massively parallel machines um, where essentially, you know, I think you have something like a board with 1,024 slots and you just plug in as many of these parallel computers uh, processes as you can buy and i think the university could buy quite a few of them so they're showing us this machine and saying look at the kind of machines you know that you'll be using when you come here and of course did i ever get any time on that transputer <laughs> i did not um, <laughs> i think that was probably for the postgrads they kept it jealously to themselves but uh, we had some sun machines i think we had two um spark stations um, for several hundred undergrads. So, you know, we would have an account on there. We could go in and we can compile C programs and we can do like this. But okay. that was that was pretty awesome because, I mean, I did not have a sun machine of my own at home. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a Unix machine or anything like this to play with. So this is big stuff, big iron. So then your your degree there is really focused on on that Unix operating system and, and software development. Like, what I like asking is, like, Obviously, the tech you were working on back then isn't the tech you're working on today, right? Um, or is it? We were based on uh, Macs in the lab. So these were, I think, Mac 2s um, and uh, LCs when they came out. So having a color Mac was like, you know, that was amazing. First of all, the Mac itself was an incredible revelation to me because if, you, if you've used, uh, you know, if you've used a, a clunky old PC, with Windows 1.0, you know, it's like, okay, it's graphics, but we feel like this could be more. And then you see a Mac and you're kind of like, wow, this is clearly how it's supposed to be. Um, you know, and when the Mac goes color, this is incredible. It's like that moment in The Wizard of Oz where we go to color and suddenly it's like stepping through into a, into a new world. Amazing. Yeah, I remember when I got my first color graphics card for the for a DOS machine I had. And ended up being, actually, I have a similar story with my mom. My mom ended up having a computer, and she got the first graphics card that was color. Boy, I wanted that thing so bad. <laughs> but you're right, it was like magical. It just watching it all kind of progress was magical. But what do you feel like you got, what was, from the university degree, what do you feel like was, you got the most out of that, and what is, what are you still kind of carrying on from today with that degree that you got 
Yeah, well, this is something people still debate about a lot, isn't it? Whether a CS degree or something adjacent to that is actually really important for a software engineering, engineering career or tech career in general. Um, and people who have such a degree tend to think it's really important. And those who don't tend to think, you know, it's irrelevant and you can manage fine without it. Um, I think mine was, I mean, I was expecting to learn to program. And there was a lot less of that than I expected. Um, and the programming we were doing was initially in Modular 2, which, uh, you know, as you know, is a, an offshoot of Pascal. Um, so not, you know, I can hardly say that that skilled me up for today's workplace. Um, but I'm sure as learning really important programming concepts, you know, functions, modules, um, designing APIs and how to structure projects, you know, all of this stuff, which uh, is still really important today. The language syntax changes, but that problem about how to design and organize your packages is still with us, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's the universal problem uh, since we've, right? I mean, programming languages have come out almost to just solve that problem alone. How do you package and organize your source code so you can build large systems, right? Right, and I think that's that's something that, you know, when I'm writing my basic programs on the ZX81 and I'm writing 10 print John Rules 20, go to 10, you know, um, this is great. And, uh, and it's a fantastic thing that you can have this machine which you just turn it on and you can start coding and running your programs and seeing them happen. That's not true of computers now, is it? I mean, if you, if you buy a Mac... You know, you don't just open it up and start programming it. You have to install language tools and editor and set up your environment. And, you know, so there's a bit more of a barrier there, um, I think. Although, you know, nerdy kids like me will have no problem overcoming that. Um, but when I, I get to college and I start programming Unix and I start programming on the Macs uh, in C, and I see this beautiful, you know, we have this beautiful GUI interface applications, menus, windows, mice, and so and so forth. And when I start to try to write that kind of application myself, I'm a bit dismayed by how difficult that is. Because <laughs> if you remember the original inside Macintosh books, like this, you know, this SDK book is kind of a whole wall of, uh, of books, each of them very fat, about 10 volumes or something. And this is basically the, um, you know, the Mac OS API reference. Um, and so I'm kind of like, okay, let's try and do something like, let, let's display a window. You know, that can't be too hard. <laughs> and there's <laughs> approximately, you know, 250 lines of boilerplate C, uh, lots of header files and stuff, just to get a window up. And I'm thinking, wow, this is harder than I expected. Um, maybe I can display some text. You know, three months later, I've managed to display some text. And that now I want a scroll bar, and I'm thinking, okay, I expect there's some kind of scroll bar component that I can include. Um, but no, if you want a scroll bar, you have to draw a rectangular area at the right-hand side of your window. You have to draw a smaller rectangle representing the scroll thumb, and you have to handle the mouse events that move it and so forth. And I'm thinking, look, this feels like it should be a solved problem. <laughs> you know, scrolling text, like I can't believe I have to implement the scroll bar myself. Um, Every every Mac app has a scroll bar, and I can't believe every programmer reinvented it themselves. Um, so we were in the very early days, then I think, where you know we didn't really have this concept of completely reusable components that you can just drag and drop into your app if you like. Were you getting discouraged at all during that time, where like you starting to get frustrated, or you just you took it as a challenge? And yeah, I think I pretty much was. I was like, wow, you know. Um, GUI programming is super hard. Um, and if you get even the slightest thing wrong, because of course this is C, so you will be getting things wrong all the time, and your beautiful GUI disappears to be replaced by a screen full of hex <laughs> in text <laughs> mode. You know, you drop into this Mac debugger interface, which says, yeah, your registers contain X, Y, and Z, here's your stack, you know, and I'm like, wow, what's this? 
you know, oh. so, suddenly the beautiful interface disappeared and we saw behind the curtain. Well, I, I still think front end development, GUI development's hard. I, I, my brain, as soon as you add more than three buttons on a screen, my brain shuts down. I've never been able to write clean code that maintains good mental models in these event-based it's event-based software. Just can, I can't do it. I've tried. Exactly. It's really hard. So, um, but I think you know, I was I was struggling to you know, if you asked me to write simple programs, I could definitely do that. Um, but when the code grows to a certain point and you have more than a certain number of levels of abstraction, you know, it just becomes really hard to organize it in my mind. Um, how to make things logical and readable and you know, I don't think I still have the source code of any of those programs, and I'm kind of glad of that because if anybody saw them now, it would be like, ah, this is horrible. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so, so t talk to me about now. You, you finish university. Um, are you able to find a job right away? What, what are you? What's happening right as you graduate? Yeah. So oddly enough, I um, I apply for a bunch of jobs as a programmer, sort of expected path out of a CS degree and I don't get any of them so you know I don't remember whether I think of myself as uh, you know a hot programmer at this point but I'm here to tell you you know hiring managers certainly did not uh, think of me that way so for whatever reason you know um, that didn't pan out and I actually get a job as a technical writer with a computer company so this is uh Scion, who uh, used to make little palm tops back in the 90s, and uh, we don't even we don't even have palm tops anymore because we just have smartphones. But before we had smartphones, we had a device which is everything a smartphone is except just not being a phone. Yeah, I remember that stuff. Yeah, I remember having a couple of those. Yeah, really nice machines. Um, and w one thing I learned from working with the super smart people who programmed. The application for these and of course it had a bespoke os you know but people are not buying in and licensing something like android of course they're creating the whole thing from scratch um and maintaining it themselves and because these devices are so tiny i forget what size of memory they had but it's some kind of solid state uh, disk uh, which is tiny so there's not much room for apps and user data and then the memory is also tiny so there's not much room for stuff so um these guys were the ultimate defensive programmers you know everything they do they basically have to figure that we may run out of memory at any second we may not have any disk space um we may run out of battery or something like this so but you know we also can't afford a great deal of code to check for these situations um so when they want to add a feature to let's say the calendar application, you know, all of, all of the space allowable is already completely taken up. Every byte is used. Um, so if they want to add a feature, basically they have to figure out how many bytes can we save by refactoring the existing code. Okay, we, we spent a month on this and we freed up 18 bytes. <laughs> wow. Can we do the feature in 18 bytes? You know, and very ingenious, by means of very ingenious programming, they could. Um, I think that taught me a lot about, you know, the power of optimization um, and these sort of things. Now, by comparison today, you know, we have virtually infinite computing resources. You know, the CPU is as fast as you could ever want. You've got all the memory in the world. You've got all the disk in the world. You're never going to run out. So we don't think about programming in quite the same way these days. So, no, not, no, not at all. So while you are... A technical writer there, they're letting you get your hands dirty in the code as well? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I'm talking to all of the developers and learning a lot, obviously, because I'm having to learn from them. How does it work technically? And then I need to go away and try and figure out how to explain this in English, right? You know, these, these folks are very good technically. They understand how the system works. And it's my job to basically understand it to a certain level in the way they do. And then try and figure out how to explain that to someone. But you were writing technical documentation for the engineers, or you were writing user facing? Both. So I'm writing the user manuals, like, congratulations on buying 
your new Scion pumped up. Here's how to get started. Type in your address details and so forth. Here's how to set your bingly, bingly beep alerts for your meetings and whatever. But yeah, I'm also writing programmer documentation for APIs. Here's how to use our CSDK to write apps for the machine um, and things like this. So I learned a huge amount from that. Um, and probably, you know, the most valuable lesson I learned was that this stuff is hard. It's just, just really, really difficult to explain complex technical concepts in user-friendly language because whatever I would write would come back with red ink all over it saying, you know, nobody's going to understand this. Please write, rewrite until it's clearer. Rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Um, and I'm still, you know, I still go through this process today. I write a draft of a book and I send it out to beta readers and they send it back and say, yeah, I didn't understand this entire chapter. <laughs> Can you have another go? <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, I, yeah, I get that. But this is interesting because you almost got a whole formal education in this first job in technical writing and, and teaching. Yeah, that's right. Wow. So how long, I have two questions. I, I, this is why I love kind of digging in. While you were writing the technical documentation, you must have been building or attempting to build or add-ons or features or something to the device too, right? I mean, you're doing programming. Yeah, I was definitely doing a lot of hobby programming um, and stuff on the side. And I, I guess I didn't even really think about, um, you know, the connection between those two things. I, I just see it as like, this is an activity that I do. It's a fun hobby. Um, meanwhile, you know, now I'm at work. So I'm not really thinking about myself as professional programmer, professional engineer, whatever. Um, but nonetheless, those lessons are seeping in and I'm surrounded by super smart people who are great programmers and I'm absorbing stuff from them without even realizing it. Were you at all discouraged, upset that you were doing technical writing and not like, was this, you took this job because you needed it and now they have you doing technical writing and, and at the time did you feel like, did you ever feel discouraged or negative about what you were doing even though I think when you look back on it today, this was probably the best thing that could have happened to you coming out of university. Yeah, I think that's right. And I I would see it that way now in that I think, you know, how how dare they not recognize my incipient genius as uh, <laughs> the world's greatest engineer, you know. I certainly didn't feel like that then. I, I was kind of absolutely amazed and gratified that I have a job and I get to sit in a nice warm room playing with computers and I get free coffee. Um, I mean, I could be doing real work, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, writing's real work. I mean, let's let's be honest. Like, writing is not. I I find it to be real work. Like, I have to actually get myself a little pumped up to do it because I know how much work there is involved once you start. Right. Oh yeah, it definitely is work. But at the same time, it's um, enjoyable work mostly that we can do in a comfortable environment. It's very difficult. It's very different to something like, you know, people who get up early in the morning and go out and work construction all day. I mean, that that would kill me within hours. Um, so, you know, I think <laughs> yeah, I every it. day that uh, I get to have this career. So, yeah, I think I, think I thought, um, you know, I'm working for a really cool company. Um, I'm in the tech industry. This is great. I'm working with computers, which is what I want to do. Uh, I'm learning lots of cool stuff. And I guess I wasn't the world's greatest technical writer either because I kind of drifted sideways into sysadmin. Ah, how long were you at this company? I think uh, three or four years. So within a year or two, you start moving into um, sysadmin stuff. So what kind of sysadmin stuff did they have at this company? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was pretty basic, but they had things like... Um, they had um, uh, an IIS server with a little little intranet. Um, you know, I don't don't think they even had that name yet, but uh, they had stuff like this, and they had they had file sharing, and they had email servers, and they also had uh, news groups. So this is something that goes way back. You know, at university, I had been introduced to Usenet, um, and this was a complete revelation to me because I'd been on BBSs and things like this before but 
to realize that there was a huge world of people out there all arguing about programming was fantastic and i like great i I like to argue about that stuff too so uh, i found found my (laughs) spiritual home here so um so they had usenet uh, at this company and they had a little um news server to run it and uh, it was unix um because all of this stuff was unix only of course and they said you know it's like um a medical emergency on a plane you know does anybody know unix <laughs> we we have this server that we need to do stuff with does anybody is there a unix expert on the plane and i'm like yo <laughs> <laughs> uh, i got it i got you <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm like the girl in jurassic park this is a unix system i know this uh, <laughs> so that was that was great fun so i was kind of become the de facto system administrator um by virtue of the fact that I've done this stuff before. So I, yes. I end up, up running basically a lot of the internal IT systems here. Wow, okay. So you get in as a technical writer, you gotta do both user kind of manuals, technical manuals, you're digging deep into the code. Now they, they, they need somebody to help with ops, which you jump in there. You're four years in, which is a long, I mean, I guess in today's standards, it's a long time. Back then, we, you know, we stayed in companies for a while. So what happens that you leave in four years? Is it something like you're ready to move on? Is an opportunity jump into your lap? What happens and where do, where do you end up? Yeah, so essentially, you know, I'm still not being allowed to write any programs, but I'm allowed to turn the machines on and off now, which is good. So I'm making progress in that department. Um, and in fact, I've become... Um, more of uh, a technical communications guy in that they say we need to write things like press releases and so forth and uh, you know what what we actually need for this is somebody who can write and we have a ton of great writers we also need someone who actually understands the technical side and we have a ton of technical people there's very few people in the overlap of that venn diagram if you like um you know, you are technical, but at the same time, you can express yourself in words that regular people can understand. Um, so that turns out to be kind of my niche, if you like. Um, and at some point, I think the entire marketing function gets outsourced. So I'm no longer, you know, I'm no longer needed there. And I move to a job where it's full on IT. So I am IT guy, uh, in this software company and this is really cool because i I think i've kind of blagged my way into this a little bit (laughs) because in the in the interview the guy who's interviewing me asked a bunch of unix questions and i'm like great (laughs) i've got this (laughs) you know they get asked me what an inode is and i actually know this which is really cool um i've never needed that knowledge since but it came in handy at the time so so he's like wow this guy knows it all he's he's our it man um, and he says, right, here's your first job is to, uh, here's a bunch of Windows PCs in boxes. Your job is to put them together, set them up, get them all ready. And I'm kind of like, wow. <laughs> okay, are you sure? Because I never opened up a PC before. <laughs> you know, shouldn't I be qualified or something for this? Oh, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> here's a screwdriver, get on with it. Um, so that's a baptism of fire. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure not all of those PCs worked after I'd finished with them. But, uh, you know, I'm learning swiftly on the job as uh, we had to do in those days. So that must have been a more of a, a, a business-oriented office if they're bringing in PCs and Windows, right? Or they, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so you're still not programming though, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're still just kind of doing ops and you're maintaining the PCs and you're maintaining the networks and the file systems for this company. Yeah, that's right. So, and I'm also I'm supporting web servers, you know, that are running websites and also the software that we're making is for websites. So this is a very early you can think of it as very early kind of CMS or e-commerce system where uh, it's essentially a bunch of C libraries which is, you know, you want to write your uh, online shop application, you write it in C and you use these libraries. And they give you things like shopping cart, user sessions, payments, um, product catalog, all of this kind of thing. Um, 
And so I'm supporting these developers, you know, with their language tools, build process, releases, and so forth. And I'm also looking after web servers. So at some point, you transition into both software development and, and training. So, so, so when does all that happen? At this, like, when, when do you make that transition? How does that transition occur? Yeah, so I think basically what happens is you, you and I know and all sysadmins know that there's actually a ton of programming involved just in maintaining systems, you know, all the shell scripts and automation and things like this that happen behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm administering a bunch of these systems and I have, um, you know, I have config management problems. This, this won't surprise anybody. Um, <laughs> no. As soon as you have more than one machine, you have a config management problem. Um, so I'm, I'm working on little scripts and things like this. And of course, I'm talking to the developers and they're, and they're saying, yeah, you know, I use make files and things like this. Um, why don't you do this? And uh, so I'm learning a bunch of ideas from them. And they're saying, hey, we put our code in source control. How about you? You know, and uh, so I'm like, yeah, this is an interesting idea. All of these scripts and config files and setup routines I have are actually code as well, aren't they? Um, so why not treat those like code? Why not version them, um, deploy them properly? All of this kind of thing. So, you know, I and, and when the company starts to produce... Uh, shrink wrap products which people can buy and they install on their own machines they need installation scripts they need setup they need manuals of course so i'm working on that and i'm also writing the installers and configurators uh, and things like this so uh, at some point i realize i've become uh, a kind of a build tools guy you know and what, what i'm doing is basically devops although we don't have that term yet so the work was going always going on before we had a name for it, but this is basically DevOps stuff. So um, everything between you know the application code and where that hits the metal is basically my domain. Today you have your own consulting company, right? You're consulting on projects. You're still doing your technical writing. You're writing books. H how do you get from you know, working there to starting your own business. Talk a little bit about how that ends up happening. Yeah, so, um, you know, this uh, this company that um, I'm, I'm essentially sort of learning the craft of programming through uh, writing install tools and system maintenance and config management scripts and things. And uh, this company is, so this is about uh, 2000, so... Everybody's very excited. Tech stocks are really high. Um, stock options are a good thing to have. And then one day they weren't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, this market just disappears completely. And uh, the company is defunct. And uh, we're all having to find our way into other jobs. And uh, so the job I get is working in a data center for a hosting company. Um, because I know Unix, <laughs> so thank, thanks again, Unix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's stood me in good stead over the years. So um, so again, so I, I'm building um, Sun OS and Solaris machi machines, and I'm seeing my first Linux machines, um, and uh, I um, you, you hear about sometimes you don't get this so much anymore, but when you had uh, machines in racks in data centers and you would have a thing called intelligent hands right you know this is like if a cd needs to be inserted or a machine needs to be power cycled or something like this reconfigure a router um well i was the intelligent hands so <laughs> you know this, this, this term is quite broad um but nonetheless that's what i'm doing i am working the night shift uh in the data center i am racking and cabling um, I'm crawling around in the roof space, running Cat5, um, and uh, you know I'm I'm pulling cards on Cisco switches, and I'm changing 
uh, memory sims and things like this so this is great um i'm learning tons of useful hardware stuff and how how big isps actually work how big hosting operations work when when you have 10 computers to run you can do it in a kind of an ad hoc way when you have 10,000 computers to run it's a different story you know you need a great deal of automation so i'm i'm learning how all of this works yeah that, that's new back then uh, the idea of you having your own data center with 10,000 machines i mean HashiCorp wasn't around yet to help. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of this stuff um, was done with, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you would you would uh, effectively netboot machines with a profile which installs the OS, for, you know, from some jumpstart TFTP server. Um, it installs a pre-configured OS with the packages you need and things like this. And basically, we have a big script not an executable script, just a paper script that we go through. And it's like, okay, log in as root, type this command, install this package, edit the host file, add these entries, you know, and this is a long process for every machine. Um, so I really start thinking, you know, surely we could write programs to do some of this stuff. I mean, as you say, there were not uh, the kind of, awesome DevOps tools that we have now for configuring a bunch of machines. Um, but I thought, you know, un unlike most of the other people that I'm working with, I, I am a programmer and I, I'm quite comfortable with this stuff. So I'm thinking, why don't we, why don't we automate this? And, and I have to say this, uh, you know, this was not an environment where people were encouraged to come up with ideas <laughs> for improvements and change the way things work. It's pretty much, you know, do what you're told. Um, which is fair enough. Um, but when I eventually leave this job and I go to um, working for a much smaller software company, so I'm back in the software industry where I'm more comfortable people dress in a more relaxed way <laughs> and it's a much more laid back culture, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, Silicon Valley culture um, as opposed to uh, in the hosting industry where it's quite military style you know a lot of these guys had been in the military specifically mm -hmm. the united states navy uh in the submarine service and uh you know i guess the lessons of you know running a submarine transfer pretty well to uh running a data center uh, <laughs> but um not but not necessarily to uh creating software right so um so but but i bring all of this knowledge about how do the big boys do it you know if you have global companies like like i was running mcdonald's web service you know um so you can imagine really? they, they yeah they have they have plenty of infrastructure and and there's no shortage of money so they they have a completely replicated data center you know in every con every continent so if one goes down you know an earthquake or a dinosaur killer asteroid takes out the data center completely that's fine we just fail over to the other one um and uh you know, so so I'm learning these kind of lessons and and l looking at what big infrastructure looks like, and I I also now convinced that automation is the way forward. So I'm doing some of this stuff. So I'm using Puppet. You know, Puppet has come out. This is new and very exciting. So we're using Puppet to manage machines, and this is great. So I'm I'm effectively I've become a programmer of of Puppet code. You know, um, Unix, Unix shell scripts. Um, some Python uh, for installers and things like this, and Puppet code. And this is super interesting to me, John, because like I said, we don't, I don't really know you, but based on <clears throat> what you're doing for the last couple of years, I wouldn't have guessed that you're coming out of the kind of operations side of things. Uh, and I think that's huge knowledge to have. I think too many developers don't have that, and it hurts in terms of design and architecture. Yeah, it is really important, and um, to you know, to try and answer your question. So basically, you know, what I, I go um, after a few years in this job, I basically go independent, and they say, "What? Why shouldn't I bring this kind of knowledge to lots of companies?" Um, and so I, I start doing this. I become an independent consultant, and basically, people, you know, companies would hire me and say, "Look." We need to set up a new infrastructure 
or web apps or whatever, or we have terrible, terrible problems with our infrastructure. Can you please fix them? Um, and this is great because this is exactly what I love to do is when the client is telling me the long, sad story of everything that's wrong with their operations, my, my grin is getting bigger and bigger because I'm thinking <laughs> this is going to be so cool. You know, we're going to fix all of these problems and it's going to be great. Um, if you show me a bunch of stuff that works, I'm not interested in that because <laughs> there's nothing for me to do. Um, so I love to solve problems. Um, so this is my thing, you know, and, um, this brings us up to a couple of years ago and, um, I am getting into go. Uh, so this, I, I couldn't tell you exactly where I first heard about go or where I first saw it, but it, it must've been, you know, when it was sort of first launched to the internet, um, and there were the usual kind of hacker news discussions about it. I was aware of this. And I'm like, yeah, new trendy language on Hacker News, fine. <laughs> you know, what's what's the language this week? Um, I'm sure we'll never hear about it again. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, probably a, a few years goes by. And at some point, I just think to, uh, I think to myself, a couple of clients are starting to switch to developing their apps in Go, especially because they're moving into kubernetes and containers and they're like go seems to be the language for this stuff so we're going to move from ruby and rails or whatever to this um and i'm thinking oh okay this is interesting because i kind of know ruby i've done a ton of ruby um i know python pretty well i'm always comfortable talking to the developers i can help them debug problems in their code when it's deployed things like this go i know from nothing so this is going to be a problem. <laughs> if I if I don't want to find myself kind of out on the ledge here, I need to do a little bit of study and just get to grips with Go, you know, just so I have a nodding acquaintance with it. So I'm not completely terrified by the idea of a Go program. So I do this. Um, I get the Go programming language book. Um, and I think I take it home over the Christmas holidays and I say, right, it's you and me go, we're, we're going to sit down and I'm going to figure this stuff out. Um, and that, that was a somewhat intense experience. <laughs> As you can imagine, like if you, you start from nothing, you sit down with that book, which is an incredible book. Um, but maybe not the best thing for a complete beginner. Um, you know, I, I think of it as more of a reference book, you know, once you've learned go, you, you now I'm going to dive into GOPL and uh, really figure out everything but but somehow you know there's a lot of swearing between <laughs> there's a lot of angry words exchanged between me and the compiler you know um, uh, but but I kind of get there you know I'm able to produce simple programs with go and I'm kind of like you know what this is kind of cool like I kind of like this I don't know exactly why but for some reason this language grabs me a little more than Ruby or C or Java or any of these other things that I've used. I, I think of these things as tools. You know, you, you have some work task you need to get done. You can use these tools to do it. Whereas with Go, I'm kind of having fun. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, this is something I've thought of programming as just being work. But all of a sudden, I'm enjoying it, and I'm actually sneaking time away from paid work to say, I wonder if I can write a little Go program to do this over the weekend. You know, it, it's been so long, I forgot when I stopped being a hobby programmer, but all of a sudden, I started being one again. we got 10 minutes left, and I want to explore this last kind of piece of uh, the puzzle I have here with you. When do you decide that you want to start training and when do you decide to start writing these these books because i i do believe that the community is lacking the type and style of book you're writing right now uh, and so i'm so excited about the series that you're writing so talk a little bit about that and why the like i i think i know why you started writing these books because we're lacking it but but just take me there in the last 10 minutes yeah, well, you know, one of the things I always enjoyed most about the consulting work was not doing the work myself so much directly as, you know, teaching 
my clients and other people to use it. So often I would work with the ops team or the infrastructure team or whatever, and I, I would coach them in how to do this stuff. Um, and very often I would learn useful stuff from them and they would learn some stuff from me and so forth. But I, I you know, people always said, you seem to be really good at explaining this stuff and in a way that we get it, you know, uh, and I thought this is good. So, um, so with the uh, Go programming, I thought I, I need to do some learning. So listening to the Go Time podcast, um, Katrina Rowan was on there talking about exorcism.io. And I thought, this is great. This sounds like exactly what I want. I can go do code practice and I can get actual mentoring on my solutions. All very well to have the automated website say, sorry, your program didn't compile or it didn't pass the tests or whatever. What I want is some human telling me, yeah, what you actually want to do is this, or, you know, this is how, this is how you write really idiomatic code in Go, like this is what real engineers do. So this is great. So I, I start, um, I learn on exorcism and I become a mentor on exorcism and, and this becomes, you know, it takes up a big amount of my time. I'm having so much fun mentoring because, you know, there's, 20 new people on exorcism every day have decided this is the day I'm going to learn go right and I am their first contact so you know this is a wonderful feeling because I can show them the stuff that I've picked up uh, and I can kind of partake in their enthusiasm you know these are not uh, jaded and world weary programmers who've seen it all before it's like oh you can't impress me with you new programming languages these are people who like me when i was nine years old saying this is so cool the computer knows my name how does it know my name so this is great fun and people are always asking me you know i i really like your mentoring can i have more of it is there some way that i can pay you um you know to do this for me and so more and more of my paid work starts to be go mentoring um and go training and people say you know my company is switching to go i have 20 devs and we need to get up to speed with go like now today <laughs> you know how how quick can you get us there so this is great and um i'm learning from trying to teach people what works and what doesn't you know i i find one way to explain something and people just look blankly at me like what are you saying to me john <laughs> I, try an, I try another way and maybe it gets through and then I hit on something and they're like ah now I get it so I, I'm gradually learning how to teach people to program and go and this is really fun so I think you know there's, there's a limit to how many people I can mentor because there's only one of me and only so many hours what I need to do is I need to put this stuff into a book so that more people can have that same exciting experience that I had when I was a little kid and just get turned on to the whole idea of programming. Um, so this is what I've done. And you, I, I definitely don't think it's a case of there aren't any decent go books out there. I need to write one. That would be very arrogant um, because there are some really excellent books, uh, not least of all yours and which I learned from. And uh, I thought, this is fine, but I, I still know from people who've told me they've read these books and they've struggled a little bit because they're complete beginners. You know, they would never programmed before. I don't know what a variable is. I uh, don't know what a function is. So I thought that there is kind of a gap here for somebody to very gently explain <laughs> in very straightforward language and not assuming any knowledge at all just to get people over that initial hump. And then you know, they're ready to dive into more advanced books. So, so, and what I wanted to convey was not just to teach you Go, but why this language is special, why it's a little bit magical, and why it's so much fun to program in, which is why the title is For the Love of Go. Yeah, I love the title, but and I love the, the approach with the tests, because there's, just very quickly, I mean, I teach... You know, I'm teaching every week, and I and I and I get deep into a lot of stuff. But I ended up creating a new class that teaches people how to write services because I felt there was a gap between I can teach you the internals and I can teach you knowledge, I can teach you how to think, but you still haven't engineered anything yet. And so I think by leveraging the tests the way you did, you get both in that book. You get to read, you get that knowledge, 
and then you get to to write some code and, and make something turn green, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, well, look, I have yeah, totally turned on to test-driven development by working with devs who used it, and it was a completely new idea to me, especially coming from the sysadmin background. You know, we don't really have tests at all. And I was like, this is fantastic because they can change anything in their program and instantly know whether they broke something. And also when they're, when they're designing it, that writing the tests is helping them design the program because they, in order to call the function under test, they have to know its name. <laughs> so that's, that's our first design problem, right? What are we going to call it? And that tells us a lot about how it works. We need to know what to pass to it. We need to know what it gives back and we need to know what we expect it to do. So I'm in love with this idea of TDD, and I, I want to bring this to people as well. So what I don't want to do is start by teaching them a bunch of Go and then say, by the way, folks, you should be doing your tests. Now I'm going to tell you about tests. I need to tell you about tests right up front, don't I? Um, in order for you to learn how to do stuff TDD, you need to learn the T before you can get to the D. But, but this is a problem because tests are actually some of the most difficult code you'll ever write. You know, they're, they're complicated, aren't they? I mean, we have slices of test cases and we have loops and we have comparisons and things like this. So um, I'm a bit blocked about how to, you know, how to how to teach people to do stuff test first. So what I come up with is basically this idea. I'm going to give you a bunch of code that has some tests. And first of all, I'm just going to get you to run the tests so you're comfortable with that. Now I'll give you a test that's failing. And you can look at the function under test and you can see, hopefully, it's a fairly obvious error and you can fix it. And now you have some confidence that like, yeah, I know how to use test outputs to fix my broken code. And now I'm going to say, OK, you're happy with that. I'm going to give you uh, a test, but there's no function. So you have to write the function which passes this test. OK, you're happy with that. Now you're going to write the test and then you're going to write the function. So step by step, we build people up. Um, with this, you, you sort of start with training wheels, if you like, in that you have all the tests and functions working. And then I gradually, bit by bit, take away the scaffolding until you're standing on your own. Yeah, and you get to minimize what you have to teach in the beginning, too. You know, start teaching main functions and, and imports and necessarily so. Yeah, absolutely. I completely yada yada through that whole thing. I just say, yeah, don't worry about what a function is. Don't worry about any of this stuff. Um, you are smart and you can look at this working code and you can basically figure out what you need to know. You just copy and paste and modify. And guess what? That's how real software engineers really work. <laughs> John, our hour is up. So do me a favor. Let everybody know how they can um, find you or get in touch with you, especially if they have uh, big projects coming up where they need somebody with your experience on, on, on the ops side and, and on the engineering side. Yeah, they can go to bitfieldconsulting.com, which is my website. I have a blog there, and you can buy the books directly from my website, or you can follow Bitfield on Twitter. And uh, have no doubt that I will constantly inform you at least three times a day what books I have <laughs> and where you can buy them. Brilliant. John, thank you so much for spending an hour with us today. Uh, I learned a lot. I love the story, and I, and I think when people hear other, other people's stories, they learn something about themselves too, right? And and paths and directions maybe they can take. So I really appreciate taking the time to share all that with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great fun. So this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast. Hope to see you all again real soon.